G'day, hi, and welcome. All right, I'm just going to try to do a short video. I'll do th sh uh, three short videos of each one of these kits, which I probably bought an easy uh, 25 years ago. I'm going to eventually... I, I, I just found a couple of cans of paint. I have some silver, and I have some... Uh, I have some uh, white. So I might be able to, if those... You know, be able to paint them up, so... Anyway, what I'm going to show you here, here's my first uh, Avro CF100 Mark IV. Uh, I believe that's the kind of all-weather Mark V. The Mark IV is really, the Mark V is really the Mark IV-B is what they called it. But, but anyway, just to show you, I won't take a rate out of the package, but just so you can see. And these are from Hobbycraft Canada. They're not, uh, I've built a, quite a few of their kits over the years. I haven't done a model since I was a kid, I don't think. No, well, sorry, young man. I, I was in my 20s the last time I built a model. God, that long ago. That's one. Just so you can see what you get. Got our little pilots in here. Uh, the quality of the uh, Hobbycraft Canada stuff is... Uh, it's not the top of, top of the line detail or anything like that. But it's, they're good starter kits. Uh, you know, there's enough pieces in there to keep it interesting. The detail is... Meh. You know, it's okay. It's okay. But one thing that's weird. Okay, with this airplane, I got it right. But look at... Okay, that's 597. But I got tail number 528. What's going on here? And I got 18597. And here I got 18528. Hmm. And that's the Belgium. Uh, you have Belgium colors and you have Canadian colors. Uh, I can't remember how many... Um, squadrons there were for the CF-100s. I, I think it was like about 10 or 12 squadrons or something like that. You'll have to look it up, but let's give you a read of the CF-100 here, and then we'll go through the plans to show you what you're looking at. All right, designed to meet RCAF requirements for an all-weather day-night fighter capable of effectively operating in the Arctic regions, the CF-100 was intended to counter the growing threat of Soviet bombers in the late 40s. Dun, dun, dun. The prototype flew in January 19th. It doesn't say it here, but I read it uh, on the side of the... In uh, January 19th, 1950, and gained acceptance in 1953, dubbed the Canuck. It sturdy soon earned its name Clunk. Uh, the Clunk was because when the landing gear came down, it... <laughs> That's what all the, pi the pilots said. It made a hell of a racket when it came down. They always thought something was breaking off the airplane, but it was a very reliable airplane. Developed Marks 1, 2, and 3, and the Mark 4B entered operation uh, service in 1954, and in 56, four squadrons uh, demonstrated its superiority over the CL-13 Sabre, frequently grounded due to foul weather. Um, it eventually replaced, the C, uh, replaced by the CF-104 Starfighter in 1963. The last Mark V was retired in December 1981 after 31 years of service. Ain't that, ain't that something else, eh? So again, a Cold War horse here that we owe a debt of gratitude to. And it's always the unsung... I don't know how this airplane wasn't kind of glamorous. It was glamorous and it wasn't. It was fugly. The CF-100 is a fugly airplane. It's got a cool factor to it. It's very jet age looking stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, but anyway, here's the plans. We'll have a look at the plans. See how they... There's the little pilots. Not the most detailed little pilots, but, uh, you know, there's stage one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um... I'm going to show you something interesting on the CF-100s. Uh, I've already done other videos on, you know, the capabilities and what it did and all that stuff, but... Uh, okay. See that? See that? Flip it over. And here we got the... Here's the Canadian painting markings. Belgian painting marking. Painting markings. Now, like I said, I probably bought these about 25 years ago. And I think it's about time I do another. I haven't, I haven't built a model in such a long time. But it is winter time now, so it's a good time to do this. But I'm going to show you something. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. Okay. So, okay, we've got two. 
just to show you, okay, we got this here, right? This and this. Okay, that's obviously that. But here are the fuel tanks that go there as well. So we got one, two fuel tanks. What the hell are these things? Smaller fuel tanks? No, they are not what they are. And a lot of people, again, uh, I've had people think I was smoking, um, smoking crack or something when I said this, but they didn't believe me. But the history of the CF-100 is kind of interesting. What we have here is rocket pods. Yes, they were basically it was to keep the slipstream of the airplane, I guess, cleaner, so you could you know you didn't have as much drag. But you had 58 rockets between the two of them. The radar was basically like a range finder, and it had because uh, I've sat in the real CF 100s uh, when I worked at the CF uh, at the uh, National Aviation Museum in Ottawa about 25 years ago. Um, I sat in the the, the uh, cockpit demonstr the uh, uh, what you call it the simulator, as well as the one in the museum, and then there was the uh, the Mark V uh, prototype. It was all full of bird poop. I had to go out and clean it up, but I got to jump in and do it. Was, it, was, it was all there, but it was, you know, they, they, they cleaned it up. I think it ended up at the Hamilton uh, Warplane Heritage Museum eventually, but it was the all black one. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so there was a radar. It would guide you, uh, the ground would guide the airplane to the bombers. And then when, once you got to the bombers, there was like a, basically this radar would pick up the bombers and it would tell you on a little screen, you would see like these X's coming in like this and then whenever you were within uh basically kind of like bullseye uh target range uh optimal firing range a little square box would come out and then you'd hit the guns you had 850 caliber machine guns that usually they don't have it in the picture here um but basically dropped down and uh you had 850 calibers in there so you could open fire with the 850 calibers and then fire your 58 rockets in one one big salvo was just, and then these little pods would just jettison off the aircraft. Well, you didn't need them anymore, right? Because also would, you know, to keep the aerodynamics of it. Later on, you would be have uh, up to like four to six hard points on there for carrying missiles. And you could also, like I say, put fuel tanks on the end on, on the end of the uh, on the end of the uh, wingtips. I did talk to some CF one hundred pilots. They always loved the airplane. Uh, I, I talked to a pilot. He flew. The Starfighter, the Saber. It was obviously an older guy. The CL one, uh, CL thirties, uh, the which was like uh, the P eighty Shooting Star, but the Canadian version, and also the CF one hundreds as well as the CF. He finished his career just as the the CF one hundred one Voodoo's came in, and he. I don't think he flew the F five at all, but. Uh, you know, uh, or the C, uh, the CF-116, which is basically a Canadian version of the F-5. Uh, but, yeah, he, he liked it. He said uh, it would do Mach 1 in a dive. I mean, but you had to be careful of how you did it or else you'd go into a flat spin and die, uh, that type of thing. Um, it, but he said, yeah, you had about a four and a half, five hour range on them, depending on the speed you flew at. It flew in all weather. He was telling me some of the, like, they would land, they they didn't, you know, he said that we'd be landing this thing in pitch black, dark, and fog. He says, uh, there was a few times, he said, they, they landed one time, they thought they landed on the runway, but they actually landed beside the runway. And they're like, well, you know, it was, I think it was either in Belgium or in Germany or wherever. But he said he landed, and when they landed, he says, like, oh, this runway's kind of choppy. And then they realized they landed right beside the runway in the grass. <laughs> But I mean, the airplane could take it. It was just one of those airplanes that was just, it was very robust. It was, I don't know what the maintenance schedule was on these things. I never asked about that. I should have. Uh, and then I've also talked to a, um, uh, what you call it, the uh, navigator was in the back. Uh, he basically was your communications. He was the guy that would tell the pilot. He, he's going, I, he goes, I had the best job. I always got to tell the pilot where to go. <laughs> and stuff like that he was telling us about he was telling me about how uh you know they intercepted bomb russian bombers and stuff like that and you know they'd wave to them they'd do a wing over the bomber they do all kinds of stuff back then right that you wouldn't be allowed to do now and with the tensions now like back then he says that it was more playful uh they knew we were there we knew they were there we'd go and uh, you know, we, we like, you know, like zoom past them and they, they, they do all kinds of stuff and, you know, play cat and mouse with the bombers. Right. And I mean, that's what these guys lived for. That's, that's what their job was. Even though it also, I guess, b between the pilots from different nations, it was also a way to kind of, you know, keep in mind that, you know, 
you may have to do a nasty job because that other guy's coming in with his bomber to do a really nasty job with nukes in the belly, right? So, yeah, so he told me about all the TU-95 intercepts. That he, I think he said he intercepted four, one going down to Cuba, one going another way or whatever, and stuff like that. And it was all, most of it, he said, took place over the Arctic. But he says, yeah, you know, he says it was a good airplane. It always worked, uh, that type of thing. So, anyway, that's the first one. Now, the second one is pretty much the same kind of kit, but it's a little different. And I'll do that one in the next video.